Uh, how's everybody doing? Great. 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 All right. So uh, unlike uh, Kelsey, I don't have a lot of uh, experience public speaking, so hopefully this will go well, um, and I can tuck this under my belt as uh, a good experience. But uh, we shall see. You said I work for Box, and uh, I'm going to tell my story about how we migrated from uh, Nagios to Sensu. Uh, that's me. Um, I'm a senior infrastructure uh, SRE at Box. Um, been there for about uh, three years. And as far as uh, infrastructure SRE is concerned, we uh, design, build, and maintain um, systems uh, such as uh, authentication, um, configuration management, which we use uh, Puppet and a little bit of Ansible, uh, domain name services, which we use Bind and a little bit of um, Infoblox, or actually a lot of info Infoblox. Um, provisioning, which is evolving. We use uh, Cobbler and, and Collins at the moment. Uh, Yum repositories, and of course, uh, monitoring and learning. Um, we have some very in, um, smart uh, SREs working for us. We have uh, Ben, Danny, uh, David, Gaurav, Luke, which is act he's actually in the back there, uh, Mani, and uh, Steve. Uh, actually, Mani, which was our manager, uh, went on to Greener Pastures uh, just recently. So uh, I wish him a lot of luck and success. Actually, he's the reason why I'm, I'm up here. He encouraged me to, to give this talk and uh, said, oh, yeah, I'll be there to support you, and then uh, ended up <laughs> Ended up leaving, so, you know, I have a, a bone to pick with him uh, <laughs> later. <laughs> so here's the agenda that uh, I'm going to follow. Uh, first, I'm going to talk briefly about what is Box, uh, and then go over our infrastructure a little bit, an overview, and then talk about our legacy system, monitoring system, which was Nagios, um, and then go into uh, the, the new system, new generation system, which is Sensu, and talk about a little bit of the the process we use to do the migration, uh, and then talk about the end results and um, what's next on the horizon for us, the near-term horizon, and then possibly do a, a Q&A. So what is Box? Box is a leader in the content co collaboration uh, platform industry. Uh, it has offices in Red Redwood City, uh, Australia, uh, Asia, and, and uh, Europe. Uh, we're growing quite extensively, uh, trying to increase our, our footprint, increase our customer count. At the moment, we have about 82,000 paid paying uh, enterprise uh, users and about 11 million uh, individual users. So if uh, any of you guys are one of our customers, thank you very much for keeping me employed. We got one hand there. For the rest of you guys that didn't uh, raise your hand, please use Box. <laughs> I need the job. Believe me, believe me. Um, we have about 1,300 uh, employees uh, overall, um, and we're building offices and expanding um, as we speak. And to the left is a list of all of our amazing products that uh, the 1,300 employees um, build, uh, sell, and, and maintain. Uh, a little bit about our infrastructure. Box has a hybrid infrastructure of bare metal uh, private cloud. Um, at the moment, we have about uh, 1,600 compute nodes that's distributed uh, globally throughout the environment. Um, to give us a visibility into our growing infrastructure, uh, we needed an alerting and monitoring platform that was uh, easy, to, easy to scale, that was secure, um, that was easy to deploy, and uh, easy to maintain. Um, unfortunately, uh, our legacy Nagio system was anything but those uh, uh, qualities. So we had to do uh, some investigating and, and uh, move away from Nagios and move to a, a more flexible architecture, which is uh, Sensu. Talking about our legacy Nagios uh, monitoring system, um, let's see, where do I begin with this? Um, we deployed, uh, we deployed a Nagios cluster to um, to every uh, application data center consisting of a single master and several uh, Nagios slaves. 
Um, we also use Thruck uh, to give us a, a single view into our infrastructure. Um, you might notice that the, the versions of Nagios that we use are, are quite old. Um, and that's mainly because we um, had, a very, uh, had a very customized environment with uh, Nagios uh, and Puppet and uh, it wasn't uh, compatible with newer versions of, of, um, of the software. Our customized, uh, our customized um, environment used uh, Puppet as a service discovery um, tool. And um, Nagios was tightly coupled with, with uh, Puppet. So any changes that we made to environment had to really go through uh, our Puppet environment and it took uh, hours and typically multiple puppet runs for changes to propagate throughout the, uh, our infrastructure. Um, using puppet in this manner was uh, very clever uh, back in this day and it was probably needed uh, when, uh, when Box was uh, very young, but um, that sort of uh, thing is kind of uh, run its cycle and that creativity has kind of put us into a uh, a box or at least a, a, um, a dead end. Um, so some of the other attributes of uh, this infrastructure is um, the clients exported puppet resources uh, to inform the Nagios of their hosts and host groups and collect exported resources to get the available uh, slaves uh, to connect to. The Nagios slaves exported their resources to Puppet in order to inform the clients and the Nagios master that they were available. Uh, the Nagios master um, retrieved the exported resources to build its configuration file. You can imagine you know, going through this process of using Puppet as a server discovery tool um, was very problematic and very time consuming. Um, and we definitely want to get away from that. Uh, customizing an environment is, is okay if you're you know, lean and you can't afford to have the best of breed of each class, but what you don't want to do is build a whole technology uh, ecosystem around that customization and uh, have it be kind of the, the foundation or the basis of, of uh, your infrastructure. Once, uh, once a system was working or when it did work, uh, the slaves actually published uh, active checks um, to uh, active check requests to the uh, the, the clients, um, and then published those uh, checks uh, passively via NCSA to the the masters. Uh, the Nagios masters received those pass passive checks uh, from the slaves, and with the, an environment producing 350,000 uh, Nagios objects and growing. Uh, the Nagios master was uh, a huge bottleneck for us. Uh, to add insult to injury, uh, the Nagios master also, also acted as a uh, fallover for uh, failed slaves, so it actually ran the, the active checks when the slave was not available. Um, this just exacerbated the situation. Some of the uh, other limitations that we had with our system was that uh, Nagios master and Nagios slaves were uh, single points of failure. The Nagios master was a single point of failure because it couldn't be uh, scaled horizontally. Uh, the Nagios slaves were a single point of failure uh, because clients had an affinity to a particular slave uh, because of that retrieval of the, the exported resource. So if that slave was not available, then of course those checks had to be handled by, uh, by the master. Adding and removing clients slaves, uh, masters, hope groups, uh, host groups, and checks was just complicated, um, took hours to perform, and took hours to propagate throughout the system. Uh, any misstep in configuration meant that uh, we could cause alert storms in the environment, increase the, the noise to signal ratio, and also made our uh, on-call engineers very unhappy. Um, decommissioning a single server could cause um, configuration um, errors if that uh, deletion of the or the decomming of that server actually caused an empty host group. To overcome some of these issues, we try to update our Nagios infrastructure uh, by upgrading um, Nagios, 
upgrading THRUC and trying to go towards a more distributed sort of system. Unfortunately, uh, our attempts uh, were unsuccessful, were, were not successful um, uh, because of some of the reasons why I mentioned is because we, you know, highly customized our environment and uh, uh, used uh, Puppet as a service discovery um, tool. So we uh, realized that there wasn't really a path forward for our NIGOS infrastructure, uh, but we had to keep the, the system up and running um, while we look for a new solution. Uh, so some of the other things that we tried to stabilize the system was we moved some of the network uh, plugins out of the, the core Nagios uh, clusters into their own dedicated network Nagios servers. We also targeted um, additional uh, plugins or checks um, that we um, um, identified and moved out of the, the environment and moved to uh, other systems like uh, Wavefront or um, other th things like that. So after we stabilized our uh, environment, we focused on our next generation um, monitoring system. We did our due diligence and uh, sent out our uh, requirements, a uh, long list of requirements, and since we um, met most of them, requirements like monitoring our entire hybrid uh, environment, uh, system that can, uh, containing no single points of failure, uh, being, easily, um, uh, being easily deployed, scaled, secure, and uh, maintained, uh, integrating with uh, PagerDuty, Slack, email, um, Jira, and uh, Puppet, uh, and, uh, most, and most important, using our existing um, Nagios plugins. We uh, ran a proof of concept with uh, Sensu to actually make sure that it did what we thought it could do and what Sensu uh, claimed it could do, and uh, it, it did, actually. So after that uh, proof of concept, what we needed to do is uh, define uh, an architecture. Um, and the architecture you see here um, it kind of evolved over time. We worked with uh, Cameron from Sensu App to uh, help define our initial uh, preliminary architecture and has since uh, evolved to what you see on the screen. Uh, each one of our application data centers uh, is equipped with um, two physical clouds that act as a single logical cloud. Uh, we deploy a Sensu cluster um, to each logical cloud, uh, distributing the, the Sensu components as evenly as possible over the physical clouds, over uh, different racks, and over different hypervisors to increase our uh, availability. Um, there are two Sensu uh, desktop servers, or not uh, desktop, but uh, dashboard servers um, in each physical cloud. Um, each one is installed with Exa BGP um, and, uh, and a health check to announce their availability for connections. A failure for any uh, dashboard uh, means that a user will get routed to the, the, uh, the closest um, dashboard server. So this design is not necessarily a, a load balancer, but it's actually for uh, availability. We do want to uh, implement load balancing um, in the future, maybe in the Q3 or, or Q4. Uh, when we installed Redis Sentinel on each one of our uh, RabbitMQ servers to um, monitor the Redis, um, Redis availability and to manage the, the failover between the, the Redis master and the, the Redis, uh, Redis slave. We had uh, reservations about um, deploying uh, the RabbitMQ servers and Redis across the two physical uh, clouds uh, because of concerns of uh, split brain sort of issues. But the advantage of, of and the increases of availability kind of uh, outweighed the, the risk of uh, having a split brain situation happen. Uh, hosts in our private cloud, as you see at the bottom, uh, private and public cloud, connects to our RabbitMQ uh, servers uh, through a secure connection. So with this uh, configuration, we really don't have any sorts of single points of failure. Uh, everything can be uh, scaled uh, horizontally, um, as you can see, or you probably already know since you're here. And um, the system is easily to, to, uh, easy to deploy since we are opening up uh, new locations and new data centers, and it's easy to manage. 
So after we had our architecture set, all we needed to do was do the, the implementation. Our implementation um, did have some challenges. Um, our green field that I thought I had was not actually green, but it was a bit brown, a little rocky, and had some spatters of uh, um, tree stumps. So in addition to customizing our Nagus environment, we customized lots of other things also, including our RabbitMQ modules and our uh, Redis modules. Um, for, our mo for our new monitoring system, we wanted to use best practices and leverage the internet community by using uh, Puppet Forge modules uh, as best we could. We spent about three or four weeks um, in the early part of the, the project um, renaming custom modules, upgrading dependent modules, and modifying Puppet code to turn our, our field from brown to, to green. Once we had a, a green field, then we um, deployed Sensu, RabbitMQ, and Redis Forge modules to our Puppet R10K repository. Uh, here on our, your left side, uh, I guess it is my left side also, um, um, is a uh, kind of a snippet of our uh, Puppet file. And you can see there's a list of uh, dependent modules uh, that's required to, to run Puppet. So that's kind of like the, the apt and concat and uh, epel, rabbitmq, redis, sensu, and standard lib. To the right is a snippet of our uh, Puppet nose definition um, that we use to give our um, a server, or uh, we use to define each uh, component. Uh, we thought about using an external node classifier, but we didn't want to be uh, have dependency on um, yet another uh, system, so we stuck with uh, Puppet node uh, definition. Sticking with the best practices, we went with uh, the roles and profiles. Uh, here's a snippet on your left of the standard roles that we use. And this is not really you know, one file, one contiguous file. I just uh, cut and paste to give you an idea of, of um, the best practice that we use. And to the right, we have a list of the, the profiles that actually does the, the hard work for us, the heavy lifting um, that we use to establish frameworks to make our migration uh, easier and to also um, help with uh, users um, adopt, um, adopt uh, the product. Here's an example uh, to illustrate one of the frameworks that we use to enable users um, to add, add key pairs to Hira uh, hash variables to configure uh, Sensu contacts uh, for PagerDuty, email, and Jira. Uh, users really don't need to know uh, Sensu, Puppet, or JSON to add contacts for their checks. And since we have a, kind of a distributed environment for uh, service owners, um, they are really good at uh, managing their services, but uh, they don't necessarily know about uh, Puppet or Sensu. And in order to have this adoption, we need to make things as, as simple as possible so that they could uh, migrate their checks over to the, the new environment. And just to the right is the, the code that we use to uh, uh, parse the, the hash and do the, the Sensu um, uh, colon colon contact to actually create the create the contacts. Nagios, um, the next thing that we did was um, did a uh, a mapping of all the the Nagios classes to Sensu classes. You can see uh, at the top we have uh, the Nagios client add to host group, which maps to the the Sensu subscription. And the Nagios Magic uh, also um, maps to the Sensu subscription. Uh, the Magic is um, where most of the complexity was for all the, the service discovery um, mechanisms that was used in Puppet. So although this uh, mapping goes to the Sensu subscription, uh, we deleted a lot of that code to uh, remove that sort of dependency on uh, service discovery. As far as a check definition is concerned, there were three uh, classes that we identified that mapped to the Sensu check, and that was the Nagios object, uh, service, uh, host group, and command. So one of the uh, examples that we have for the, the mapping, as you can see on the screen, 
is that there are three uh, Nagios classes that I mentioned, the host group, command, and service, that maps it to one sensu check. This sort of mapping made uh, our environment uh, much easier uh, to maintain and made our puppet code a lot cleaner. And uh, consequently made you know, adoption a lot better uh, because the overhead to do the migration um, and add checks uh, was a lot lower. Uh, next we have an example of an aggregate check. Uh, one Nagios host group class and two Nagios service classes uh, is needed to configure aggregate checks. The, the class at the top just configures regular ba uh, the basic Nagios check and the service class at the bottom actually configures uh, uh, the, the aggregate check for the, the basic uh, check. And then the host group just defines uh, the name. So that actually maps to two uh, Nagios, I mean two Sensu checks. Um, the top one actually is uh, the check definition for the actual check and the bottom one is uh, the check definition for the, the aggregate. Um, so you'll note that uh, the handle for the, the regular check definition is false because you want to actually handle the or define the handler in the aggregate check. And also note that, um, that we use uh, tokens, uh, which, is, which is denoted by the, the triple colons on the left and the right, so that users can define the, the API host, API ports, API username, and API password. So having the users define that um, makes a subscription call uh, a little bit more complicated. So what we did was, um, or uh, what I did was write a, um, a wrapper around uh, the Sensu uh, subscription call that did the, the heavy lifting that defined or configured uh, a custom hash uh, configuring the Sensu APIs for the host port and user and issued a, um, a uh, call to Sensu subscription with that uh, customized hash. Uh, what this does is it has a side effect of, it, it adds that, um, that custom hash to every, every uh, check and has a side effect uh, of adding that hash to non-aggregate um, checks, but um, that's kind of harmless. We'll probably add logic here later to exclude non-aggregate uh, hashes. And so what you have here at the top is what uh, users would have had to uh, um, input into Puppet in order to have our um, uh, aggregate check uh, subscription. And at the bottom is, is what they actually write now um, because all of that has kind of been abstracted away to make their lives a, a little easier. So once, uh, after we did all that mapping, we uh, had to do the, the heavy lifting. Um, I would like to stand here and say that we wrote a tool that traversed our puppet hierarchy, uh, parsed our puppet code, um, grabbed the, the Nagios class, and converted over to the, the Sensu, uh, equivalent Sensu class, but uh, we didn't do that. Um, we actually um, wanted uh, every service owner to evaluate all their checks uh, to see which ones are viable. Um, Nagios has been around for a very long time and it's very crufty, so we didn't want to actually move that cruft from uh, the Nagios server to uh, the Sensu system. Um, but due to uh, limitations and, and resources and time constraints, we had to kind of switch gears a little bit um, and we employed the uh, uh, services of a contractor to do a lot of the heavy lift lifting for us to migrate these checks uh, manually and to help the service owners that had uh, the bandwidth to do it to, uh, to help them migrate their checks. So the end result is we um, um, migrated about uh, 1,250 uh, checks uh, running over about 16,000 hosts uh, for our production environment. Uh, we also have a clus uh, cluster, a Sensu cluster for our uh, dev and staging environment that also has about uh, 3,000 servers uh, registered to it. So with this uh, deployment, we found out that 
Sensu was very easy, easy to deploy. Um, we've deployed it to roughly uh, five different uh, data centers um, and growing. We um, have scaled it uh, quite a bit. Initially, we ran our clusters on one cloud uh, and only had two enterprise servers, three um, RapidMQ servers, and one uh, data, um, uh, dashboard server. As you saw from the architecture, we scaled that horizontally. It was very easy to do. Uh, also, the, the environment increased our availability um, and increased um, um, our administration uh, over it. So what's next for us? Um, as I mentioned before, in order to stabilize the Nagio server, we moved our network uh, plugins or network checks from our main Nagio server to uh, dedicated servers. So we're going to migrate those back to our Sensu environment. We also are going to use uh, Sensu's Wavefront integration to help with migrating our metrics checks and use Sensu as a pipeline into uh, Wavefront. During this process, we had a lot of uh, questions about uh, filters from our users. So we're going to write um, uh, a bunch of um, uh, filters and, and, and supply those to our customers as a, a can sort of uh, way of, of getting those uh, filters out there. Uh, our UI servers, as I mentioned, use um, Anycast at the, mo at the, the moment. Uh, we want to implement um, real low balancing and use uh, Sensu single sign-on integration um, to, to manage the, the sign-on mechanism. Uh, we use uh, StackStorm as auto remediation. Uh, we want to increase that footprint to, uh, to further, to be deeper into our infrastructure and use Sensu as a trigger to do auto remediation. Uh, right now, we auto remediate some issues in our puppet infrastructure and uh, auto remediate some issues on uh, Sensu as well if they happen to come up. Um, <clears throat> when you saw by the uh, architecture, we actually deploy Sensu inside of our private cloud. So we want to do uh, cross data center monitoring so that we actually monitor the monitor. Uh, it doesn't do any good to try to monitor the thing that you are actually inside. Um, we either need to take the infrastructure outside of our cloud or cr uh, monitor across data center. And last thing we want to do is evaluate uh, what's new with uh, Sensu 2.0. And we'll probably get to that um, the fourth quarter of uh, this year. So we have a uh, value add box called Make Mom Proud. And hopefully with this presentation, I've made mom proud. This is one of my first and uh, few public speaking opportunities. Um, hopefully I did okay. I'll probably get better with time. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? I don't know how much time I took. We do have a couple minutes. If there are any questions in the room, please come up to a mic. Um, would you be able to give me an example or two of use cases that service owners come up to you with for aggregated checks? Um, well, actually, the picture that I showed here is a list of 13 aggregate checks. And what we have are various services um, that are distributed uh, across our infrastructure. And um, they have sort of, uh, um, they're, they're tolerant to failures. So individuals don't necessarily care whether one server or five servers or 10 servers fail. Uh, what they want is to, to know if um, some large subset of those servers have failed where they have to take action and possibly either deploy more servers or remediate the, the issue. Uh, but they're not really interested in a, a single failure. Great. Well, thanks so much, Trent. Oh, one more question coming up. Go right Can ahead. I? Uh, Trent, first of all, thank you very much for sharing. Uh, very helpful. I think you did an excellent job, by the way. Well, thank you. Uh, maybe I missed it, but uh, in terms of these event checks, do you guys do anything with integration into a ticketing system or alerting system? Uh, yes, we do. I didn't put this up there, but the, one of the, the requirements that I listed was integration into Jira. 
So that is our ticketing system. And um, we have that implemented now. Um, we, don't, we haven't rolled it out yet. We have uh, implemented it to our, our staging system um, and tested it. Our initial tests um, seemed that it was over, overwhelming our uh, ticketing system. Um, so we worked with uh, Sensu uh, to make the, the queries a little bit more um, um, focused and also um, how the, the connections uh, uh, happen. So yes, we do have those uh, integrations to, to JIRA. Also we're working with uh, to get the integrations to the Puppet so that uh, when servers are decommissioned and taken out of the uh, Puppet DB that they're also going to be you know, taken out of um, or, or deregistered with the deregistration handling. Brilliant. Yeah. All right, well, round of applause for Trent. Thanks so much. <laughs>